Michigan Christian Center. I'm so glad you could join us for our online service. I've got a great and encouraging word for you today. But before we get to that, we've got an online meet and greet. Reach out to as many people as you can. Invite them to our online services. All right, I'll see you on the other side of the meet and greet. So to be human is to go after a kingdom. And if we don't have to go after God's kingdom, we're going to go after some kingdom, something ultimate, something that's become absolutized, something that will satisfy the deepest longing in our hearts. And I love what St. Augustine said years and years ago in his uh, book, The Confessions. And he says, our hearts are restless and they will seek rest and they will only find their rest when they find their rest in God. But the problem is, even if we don't find our rest in God, we'll continue to keep searching. We'll continue to keep seeking. In fact, if I want to quote the, uh, the pop theologian uh, 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 Bruce Springsteen, he said, everyone's got a hungry heart. Everyone's hungry for something. We're looking to satisfy the human longing for purpose and meaning. And why am I saying all that? Because we're going to be looking into the scriptures in Mark's gospel, uh, chapter 1, beginning in verse 14, and we see Jesus after his temptation revealing why he has come. So let's take a look at this scripture that talks about the revelation of the kingdom of God. It says this in Mark 1 14, after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Can we pray? Father God, I thank you for this time in your word, and I pray you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear what your spirit wants to reveal to us. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we see Jesus coming after his, uh, his, the great temptation in the wilderness, and we see the purpose for why he came. He came to reveal that the kingdom of God is near. It's the gospel of the kingdom. In fact, it's called the good news of God. Uh, ta euangelion uh, ta thea, which means the gospel of God. So when we talk about the good news, when we talk about the gospel, it's God's idea. It's good news of the redemption of humanity and of the entire creation through the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus. That's really, really good news. And what we realize is that both Jesus and John the Baptist preached the exact same thing. In other words, there's a continuity of the gospel, of the good news. Not just in the New Testament, but even in the Old Testament, is that there's a kingdom. There's a kingdom of God. There's something coming, and now is, as Jesus revealed, that will uh, supersede everything that you've ever known and ever imagined. And it's going to redeem all of humanity. In fact, it says in the scripture in Revelation, uh, the 21st chapter, I believe, that he's making all things new. And, you know, we think about a world that's broken. We think about rampant injustice. 
We think about man to inhumanity to man. We think about all of the hurts and wounds we've personally fit, felt. And, and of course, if you look at the front page of any newspaper, in any day of the week, you'll see man's inhumanity to man. The world's broken. And yet, the scripture reveals to us that the kingdom of God that's coming is coming to set everything right, uh, to make everything sad untrue. And that is incredibly, incredibly great news. Good news, the scripture calls, calls it. But what we see is in order to access that good news, in order to access that kingdom, you've got to repent. And both John the Baptist said this and Jesus said this. And, and that's the key. The, the word for repentance is the Greek word metanoias, which means a turning back or a changing of one's mind. And we see this in the Old Testament concept of repentance. It means movement back to the point of departure. And what we see is humanity without Christ has departed, has departed from what the scripture calls the glory of God. We've lost the glory of God. We've lost our purpose. We've lost our meaning. Yes, we continue to seek for meaning. We continue to seek purpose. We continue to invent things. We continue to make things. We continue to make money. We continue to build and raise families and, and all these types of things. But we're, we've departed from our original purpose. And what's our original purpose? Well, we see this in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31, where the Apostle Paul says, In everything you do, do it all for the glory of God. And we see humanity outside God's rule <laughs> doing all kinds of things for their own glory, but not for the glory of God. And so this kingdom that's coming, in which there's going to be a new heavens, there's going to be a new earth, there's going to be no more sadness, no more sickness, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more crying. Who wouldn't want that? Well, there's a lot of people that wouldn't want that because they want their own glory. They want their own way. They want life without God. They are rebellious toward God. The scripture talks about the fact that all have sinned and all have fallen short of God's glory. And so there's a glory. There's a kingdom. There's a restora restoration of all things. All things are going to be made new. But in order to access this, you've got to return back to the point of departure, this metanoia, this repentance. And the, the departure is a right relationship with God. The departure is being totally open to and surrendered to and submitted to the rule and the reign of God. That's where humanity has departed. So you want to go back to the kingdom? You want to get this kingdom? You want to access this kingdom? You want to walk in the fullness of God? You want to walk in a world where there is no pain, there is no suffering, there is no sorrow, there is no sickness, there is no death? You've got to go back to the point of departure. You've got to do, you, you've got to have a change of mind and you've got to come back to God. Both John the Baptist said this and Jesus said this and it's very, very Important. In fact, the Apostle Paul says this in Acts 17 as he's preaching to and speaking to unbelieving Greeks who were representative of the Western world of which we are a part today. And he actually looked at them as he concluded speaking to them and he said this in Acts chapter 17 verse 30. It said, in the past God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent to return back to that point of departure, to go back to the place where you walked away from God and come back to God. That's the only way you can access this kingdom. And so the good news of God is this kingdom presented to humanity, the kingdom of God. And Jesus said the kingdom of God is near. And that's a reference to the idea that the kingdom of God has come through Jesus, through his ministry and his life and death and resurrection, and yet the fullness of it will not be consummated until later. But it's here for the taking, so to speak. He offers it to all of humanity. It's incredibly good news because to be human is to desire some sort of a kingdom. It's what we want. It's what we long for. And, and we've got to understand that is that every single one of us has a hungry heart. Every single one of us is going to desire something. It might be the kingdom of stuff, right? I shop, therefore I am. 
It might be the kingdom of pleasure as we're in the month of June, right? The celebration is love is just love. Hey, whatever, right? Whoever you love, just go ahead and pursue it. Is that a kingdom? Sure it is. It's a rival kingdom to the kingdom of God. That's why calls for people that are of the LGBTQ persuasion to repent is rejected and spurned because it reveals man's rebellion towards God. People would rather serve their own self, their own desires, their own whims, and not God's way. But nevertheless, it is a kingdom. There's all kinds of other kingdoms. There's political kingdoms. There's some people, even Christians, that think if I could just get the right person elected, if I could just get the right policy enacted, that will bring um, some form of utopia or some form of kingdom on the earth, right? And, and I can go on and on and on. How about the kingdom of comfort that we all Americans love, right? In, in the summertime, we love the, the comfort of air conditioning. In the winter, we love the comfort of central heating, right? We love to be comfortable. Can that be a rival kingdom? Sure it is. If we're more prone to comfort than following Jesus and his call upon our lives, we've got a rival kingdom, right? And so we've got to understand that. How do you know if you've got a kingdom you're seeking after that's not the kingdom of God? I love what Louis Giglio says in his book, The Air I Breathe. He said, you want to know if you've got a rival kingdom? It's easy. Simply follow the trail of your time and your affections, your energy and your money and your allegiance. How about this? How about following your internet trail? How about following your social media trail? In other words, at the end of that trail, you'll find a throne. And whatever is seated on that throne is of highest value to you. That's your kingdom. That's my kingdom. That's why Jesus said it this way in Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added unto you. But the problem is if we seek other kingdoms, if we seek other things first, we'll have disordered loves, we'll have a rival kingdom, we'll be cut off from the life of God the scripture reveals to us. So, so, so this is a great uh, litmus test for my heart and your heart. Where would the trail of my time and my affection and my attention and my money and my internet trail, where would that... What, what kind of a throne does that lead to? What kind of a throne or what is seated on that throne for me? What is seated on that throne for you? I can't answer that question for you. But Jesus said it this way, the kingdom of God's near, but you've got to repent so you can actually enter that kingdom. You've got to move back to a point of departure because all of us are going to have a kingdom. All of us are going to have a throne on our heart. All of us are going to have something or someone that is going to be ultimate. We're going to absolutize something in our lives. If it's not the living God of the scriptures, it will be an idol. It will be a God substitute. It will be a God surrogate. And the problem with that is we become like what we worship. Look at the scriptures here. Look at Psalm 115 verses 3 through 8. It says, our God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases him. But their idols are silver and gold made by the hands of men. They have mouths but cannot speak, eyes, and they cannot see, ears, but they cannot hear, noses, they cannot smell, hands, they cannot feel, uh, feet, but they cannot walk, nor can they utter a sound with their throats. Those who make them will be like them, and so will all who trust in him. So in other words, these worshipers, when you worship an idol, when you absolutize stuff, when you absolutize science, when you absolutize sex, when you absolutize something other than God, right? You will become as spiritually lifeless and dehumanized as the idol that you go after. In other words, you will step into a void. You will step into an area of nothingness, as it were, because you've walked away from the living God. But the problem is you don't stay you, you don't stay fixed and permanent is that you suddenly begin to become more dehumanized. In other words, to be most human is to serve the living God. 
To be the most human is to worship God, is to make him, make him and his kingdom first place in your life. To be dehumanized is to move away from that and to settle for a lesser God, a lesser idol, a lesser kingdom, a rival kingdom. And what happens is we begin to have disordered loves and that leads to a dehumanization in our lives in our hearts. And see, the scripture tells us that we are judged by the idol or the God that we serve. So that's very significant. What did Jesus talk about here in the scripture? When he talks about the kingdom of God is near, repent. Is that the kingdom of God, because of that, everything changes. And, and see, we've got to get something clear on what did Jesus mean when he said the kingdom of God is near. And there's five general interpretations of what that means. The first is that it was a political kingdom. And we see this with the early disciples. We see this of the Jews of Jesus' day. As Jesus was departing in Acts chapter uh, 1, they asked him, are you going to restore the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of Israel at this time? And Jesus said, listen, the times and seasons, it is none of your concern. Okay, But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you're to preach the gospel throughout the world, locally, regionally, Globally, right? In other words, it's not a political kingdom. Well, second of all, the interpretation is it's just a spiritual kingdom. It's something that happens in my heart. It's something that happens in your heart. That's one interpretation of it. The other, the third is that it, we've reached the end of history. Is that as, as, is that when Jesus said the kingdom of God is near, the final judgment is imminent, right? In other words, it could happen in your lifetime. That's a third interpretation. The fourth interpretation is we can actually realize the kingdom of God on this earth. In other words, the consummation of all things, we can bring this about in our lifetime, in our lifespan. And the fifth interpretation, which is the correct interpretation, is the kingdom is already, it's already come. It's already come with Jesus, the healings, the miracles, the, the devils being cast out of people, right? Jesus walking on water, the kingdom has come. It's already but it's not yet. It's not fully consummated. Let's be honest. We still die. We still get sick. There's still injustice in the world. There's still sorrow. There's still sadness. There's still hurts, right? There are, there's all kinds of issues. In other words, what Jesus was talking about is the kingdom of God is near. In other words, it's already. It's in your midst. In fact, the kingdom is a person. His name is Jesus. He's here, but not in all of its fullness. And why am I talking about this because what many Christians embrace is not the fifth understanding of what the kingdom is. It's already, but it's not yet. But many Christians say, no, the, 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 the kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. It's Jesus in my heart. After all, didn't I ask Jesus into my heart to come and live within me, to be my Lord and Savior? And so they spiritualize something that is meant to be much more than just a spiritualized version of the kingdom. In other words, the kingdom is meant to restore not just your spiritual heart within and, and renew you and give you a new spirit, but the, the, the kingdom of God is meant to redeem all of the created order. And so what, what, we, what we misunderstand is that the issue is not, I'm inviting Jesus into my heart, but he's inviting us into his kingdom, into his rule, into his reign, into his way of doing things. It is not a subjective, individualistic, Jesus coming to my heart, but Jesus is saying, hey, <laughs> man, woman, and child, whoever you are, I'm inviting you into my kingdom. Come, follow me. Come, follow me into my kingdom. Come, follow me into my rule. Come, follow me into my way of doing things, my way of restoring all things. It's a much bigger picture than what so many Christians embrace. In other words, the truth of Christianity is not just subjective me and Jesus truth. The truth of Christianity is truth for all things. In other words, truth for all spheres of culture, whether it's politics, whether it's technology, whether it's media, whether it's education, whether it's law, in all things. That's the truth that Jesus came to bring. That's the kingdom that he came to bring. It's already, but it's not yet. And I love this quote from the book, Evangelical is Not Enough, by Thomas Howard. He says this, 
The incarnation, again, this is this already and not yet aspect of the, of, of the kingdom. This is this area of, listen, Christianity is truth for all things, not just in my own heart. The incarnation takes all that properly belongs to our humanity and delivers it back to us, redeemed. All of our inclinations and appetites and capacities and yearnings and proclivities are purified and gathered up and glorified by Christ. He did not come to thin out human life. He came to set it free. All the dancing and feasting and processing and singing and building and sculpting and baking and merrymaking that belong to us and that were stolen away into the service of false gods are returned to us in the gospel. That, my friends, is the kingdom. That, my friends, is really, really, really good news. In other words, Christ didn't save us from being human. He saved us so that we could be fully human again. And so, as a result of this, we got a choice. You and I have a choice. Everyone watching this video has a choice. Which kingdom are you going to pursue? Are you going to pursue the kingdom of God or the kingdom of man? I like how St. Augustine talked about this in his book, The City of God. He said there's two cities that humanity will move toward. There's the city of man, which is the love of self and selfishness. And then there's the city of God, which is the love of God. Which kingdom are you going to pursue? Jesus said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near, right? And in other words, we are meant for the kingdom of God. And we have hints and glimpses of this. There are times when we have desires where we cannot satisfy it. There's times when we have inclinations like, man, I just can't scratch this proverbial itch, right? Is that there's like nothing in this world is satisfying me. Well, that's a, that, that's a hint. That's a glimpse. That's a signal of transcendence. That's a signal that we were not made for this world alone, but we were made for the kingdom that God has for us. I love this quote from C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity. If I find in myself a desire which no experience in the world can satisfy, most probable, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. If none of my earthly pleasures satisfy it, that does not prove that the universe is a fraud. Probably earthly pleasures were never meant to satisfy it, but only to arouse it, to suggest the real thing. If that is so, I must take care on the one hand, never to despise or be unthankful for these earthly blessings, but on the other, never to mistake them for the something else of which they are a copy, an echo, or a mirage. And there's a lot of people going after stuff of this earth that's a copy, an echo, a mirage of the full blooded, full, you know, bodied kingdom of God that we were meant to walk in and live in and move in and experience. And my prayer for all of us is that we enter more fully into that kingdom. And if there are those of you here today that you're hearing this, you've never entered into that kingdom. My prayer for you is that by faith, you would reach out toward the Lord and say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. I ask you into my heart but I desire from that point to move into your kingdom. I'm tired of my own way of life. I'm tired of the empty, uh, the, the back end, dead end streets that my life has become. I want this kingdom life you are talking about. I repent, I go back, I turn back, and I come to you. And my prayer is if you do that, you will receive the Lord Jesus Christ and you will enter his kingdom and you will walk in this fullness of life that he's talked about. Jesus said it this way, I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Father God, I thank you for this word this morning. And Father God, I ask and I pray that all of us would enter more fully into the kingdom of God. All of us would reach out toward God and say, God, I want more of this life. I want to walk in this life more. I want to be a light. I want to be a witness for you where I work, where I live, in my family, and whatever I do. And God, help me to walk in your kingdom more fully. I pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. It was great to be with you. And until next week, I call you blessed. Take care.